Marvin was in the hospital, the ICU ward. Things were not going well. In fact, the family called the pastor, asked him to come because this was his final moments on earth. Pastor stood by the bed. And Marvin's condition, it seemed to deteriorate, and he was just a little agitated, and he made a motion that he wanted a piece of paper and a pencil. And, and a good pastor always carries a pen and paper in his breast pocket, and so he handed lovingly paper and pencil to Marvin. Marvin began to scribble on the note. And when he was finished clutching the note, he started to hand it to the pastor and he drew his last breath. The pastor took the note and he thought it would not be correct or right to read the note in the ICU ward, so he placed it in his sport coat pocket. It was the funeral. And while speaking, the pastor remembered that he had the note that Marvin had written. So he reaches in the pocket and he pulls it out and he says to the congregation, and you know, I suddenly remember that um, right before Marvin died, he handed me this note. And knowing Marvin, I know that he wanted to pass on some encouraging words, something inspiring that we can all gain from. And so I have this note, and with that introduction, the pastor read, Hey, you're standing on my oxygen tube. <laughs> <laughs> It's not easy being a pastor. <laughs> we make our share of mistakes. And no doubt you find that that's true of Pastor Cran. I was once asked, what's it like to be the pastor of a church? And my answer, and it's always the same, there is no other position in the world that has a higher honor than to be called of God to pastor a church. It's also a vocation that can be terribly disappointing, frustrating. Sometimes you're misunderstood. Uh, you make mistakes. Um, you can be praised one moment and be lifted up and the next criticized and um, torn down. Over the years, huh, I've had my share of both. And I've, I've experienced the joys of pastorhood. I've also gone through the conflicts, the emotional conflicts, the disappointments and the loss. I've discovered over the years of ministry, it is really difficult to gauge success. Hmm. Church work is unique. We don't always recognize when we are successful. Now, if you run a business, then like Rufus, you understand what success is. Uh, you recognize it right away. Profits are up, uh, uh, losses are down, you see steady growth, uh, you're up to date in your technology, maybe you have a nice big building and uh, um, doesn't, doesn't help if, or doesn't hurt if you're well known and maybe even famous in the area. I mean, this all says, I am a success. Now, the church, we've looked at business, and I think we've made the mistake of trying to fall on the step with business and gauge our success. And, and by the way, I, I think a church should be run like a business. I think we should be uh, fiscally responsible, and there are some things that we can use in the business model. But big church, a big church building, that does not mean you are a successful ministry. Having a famous pastor does not mean that you have a successful minister. Annual income, it may be fantastic, all the bills paid and in the black, that does not mean that you are a success as a church. Well, we're not rolling in the dough. I'm not famous and we're not big. <laughs> Is there any hope for us? Can Dearborn Congregational Church be a success? St. Paul, and you can follow along in your insert, St. Paul provides us with some answers in his letter to the Ephesians. And this is a letter that was written to the church. 
And it's Paul's desire. I mean, he was a missionary. He established this church, and he wants it to succeed. 2,000 years later, I think this is still the answer for the local church. These are the keys that will unlock the door to success. So let's begin. Key number one, have a great faith. Paul writes in verse 16, I pray that from, the, from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Oh, to have a great faith. Did you know that on April the 6th, only 78 days away, it's opening day at Comerica Park, and our Detroit Tigers begin the 2015 season, and the experts, and I've been reading up on them, the ex experts predict that the Tigers will win their fifth straight Central Division title. And with any luck, they'll win it all and go to the World Series and be world champs. Now, it takes some faith. The organization, they have faith. They're putting all their faith into Miguel Cabrera, uh, Justin Verlander, a healthy Justin, uh, re-signing Max Scherzer. And what they're saying is that this formula will be the formula and the key to winning a championship. Well, hey, I've got faith. I think they're going to win. I'll make it, to, make it to a few games. And Paul encourages the church to have faith. And that faith is an inner strength. He says that this is having a strong faith. A successful church is strengthened by their faith. A successful church has a strong faith. You wonder what I do during the week? When I'm not working on sermons, I read. I've been reading this. It's the history of our church. These 20 years, a history of Greenfield Congregational Church, which later on became Dearborn Congregational Church. It's really some good reading. And this is the story of of how we started out. Amazing testimony of, of, of faith and determination, starting a new work in Dearborn. In the spring, it told me in the spring of 1942, the Congregational Association of Detroit decided that they were gonna plant a church in this area. And they rented a little store on Greenfield and Rotunda, you know where it's at, uh, for $50 a month. And then they got a donation of $105. They bought some chairs, borrowed an altar and a pulpit, and they began having Sunday services. And for the first three, four, five Sundays, I don't know how long it lasted, they were only having two and three people attend. <coughs> and some ministers would just give up and say, well, we made a mistake. It's not going to work. But not this minister, the founding pastor, he worked and he prayed and the people prayed and, and then one day a key family showed up and decided this is worthwhile. I want to be a part of this. And then it began to grow and blossom. Very humble be beginnings. Great faith has brought us this far. Hmm. Dearborn Congregational Church, we've been through a lot. Good times with growth and expansion, times of testing. I mean, we've had our share of heartaches and disappointments. And only heaven knows what the future holds for us. And there's going to be trials, and there's going to be tests. And the enemy will try his best to knock us down and kick us out. It takes a great faith in God to move forward. Three little words in verse 16. Tremendous amount of importance. Through his spirit. By the divine energy of God's Holy Spirit, 
we will receive all the spiritual strength we need to continue on and minister in this part of the world. I believe it. Having a great faith is the assurance that there is nothing too hard for God. Martin Luther, uh, founding father of the Reformation, the Lutheran Church, said there are two kinds of believing. One kind of belief is to believe about God. He said this, there are some things we can affirm about God that we can also say about the Turks, the devil, or hell. These are facts, encyclopedia knowledge, this is belief. And then he spoke about another kind of faith. Not only do we believe in God, but we also are challenged to put our trust in him. We bet our lives on the truth that there is a God. We even begin to give him our money because we do believe this business. We surrender to him. We follow him. We believe that he is with us and nothing can separate us from his love. Well, amen, Martin Luther. 500 years ago, he got it right. Back to our text, verse 17. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. I don't know what the future holds for us, but I have a great faith in our God. I am trusting in him. I am trusting that if he tarries, if the Lord tarries, and we're around for another hundred years, that one day our great-grandchildren will be saying, wow, those folk back in 2015, they had a tremendous amount of faith. That's why we are here today. Back to uh, scripture and the second point, the second key, we must have a great love. And Paul reveals that second element in verse number 17. When Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him, your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Faith opens the door to our soul. We receive Christ as our Savior. Faith says, Jesus, come to me. It's a great faith that holds on to the promises found in God's word. And we continue on as a church. And we exercise great faith. And as we do that, something wonderful happens in the congregation, in the heart of every believer. Love grows. Not only do we love Jesus with all of our heart, not only do we love one another with a Christian love because we are family, we have a great love for the gospel. And because we love the gospel, we love telling people about it. We want to share our faith with others, with our friends, with our family, with our neighbors, sometimes even our enemies. We sang the Christmas Carol last month, O Little Town of Bethlehem. A little story behind that uh, hymn. It was written by Phillips Brooks in 1868. Brooks was the pastor of the Trinity Church in Boston. And after his death, the congregation uh, wanted to do something that would honor his memory. They heard a sculpture. Gave him the assignment of erecting a monument for the church in the pastor's, honor, uh, pastor's name. And so for months, the artist met with members of the church, interviewing them, talking to them, those who knew about Brooks. And then he started work on a statue. And then the day came when they were to unveil the statue dedicated uh, in his honor. And there it was. And it showed Reverend Brooks standing behind the pulpit but that's not all. Behind him, with a hand on his shoulder, was Jesus. They asked why. And the artist replied, Pastor Brooks was a man whom you could not explain apart from Jesus. We need to be a people 
who cannot be explained apart from Jesus. When Jesus is in us, when we have the love of God in us, people will gravitate toward us. They're looking for something different. They're looking for love in the world. It should be a joy to come and worship at Dearborn Congregational Church. And it is when we demonstrate that kind of love. There's a third key, and I call this a great joy key. Linda, I missed you in the uh, choir. <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't be telling any more blonde jokes, and I'm not going to. And I promised myself I wouldn't pick on you anymore, but I'm going to this morning. One more. <laughs> Linda, I love talking to you, and I love it when you sing in the choir, because this lady, she sings with a joy. She's always smiling. She seems to be always happy. And I like being around her. To be spirited, to be alive, to be joyful. I think we can learn from you. I'm going up there. See what I mean? See what I mean? <laughs> when people visit our church, oh, we need to be a joyful, smiling people filled with energy. And they see that in us. They love coming here. This is a place where you can smile, where you can laugh, where you can sing. And there are times when we are serious. But joy and happiness, it's got to be in our worship service. Story of a little boy, he's in church with his mother. It's one of those long, boring, drawn out services. Finally, they reach the part in the service where the offering is being received. And as the ushers are passing the plate, the little boy looks at his mom and he says, Mom, pay the man and let's get out of here. <laughs> A successful church has a people who are gathered and they worship with great joy. Hmm. When you read verse number 19, though the scripture does not speak directly, it certainly implies that we should be a joyful people. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. i got to pick on one more person. <laughs> uh -oh. I've been singing in the choir for the last couple of months. God bless you, folk. Um, it's been a great experience, and I'll tell you why. It's because of our choir director. <laughs> I'll tell you, we stand over there and we sing, and I watch Brian as he's leading us, and he sings with us, and he he does his magic on the piano, and he does it with a smile, with a joy. You can see it in his face. And when I'm watching you, I can't help but smile. And, and I hope I'm exhibiting that same kind of joy. Like our, our morning song, our intro, wasn't that great? I, Linda, you wanted to come up here and sing, didn't you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> when you're in a worship service that is attended with people who are complete with the fullness of the life and power of God, it's always a joyful service. Amen. <laughs> Finally, a fourth key. you got to have a great message. If we want to be a success in Dearborn, we must present a great gospel message. And we have got the message. In verse 20, Paul wrote, now all the glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. This is the gospel message that we share. There's power at work in the individual. We preach power. We talk about it. We believe it. 
There is an infinite power, a divine power at work in our congregation. It began when we had our conversion experience and we knew Jesus for the very first time. And it, it's with us as we grow in Christ and as we serve in the church. His mighty power at work in us. When you have that kind of power, you can do far more than you ever dreamed or anticipated because we have a great gospel message. And the reason why it's a great gospel message, God's grace is great. Don't ask me how it works. I'll be honest with you, I don't know. All I know is that the power of God's Holy Spirit can empower us for service. This is the message that has to be preached, the gospel of empowerment. Through his mighty power, at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we, what we might ask or think. There you have it, the key to a successful church, a successful ministry. It's all here in Ephesians chapter three. Have a great faith, a great joy, a great love, a great gospel message. Let me end the sermon with one story. It's 1961. Kennedy is president of the United States and Sam Rayburn is the Speaker of the House. He's been serving in that capacity for 17 years, longest uh, tenure in US history. And then one day, Rayburn is diagnosed with terminal cancer. And he shocks everyone when he announces that he is going back to rural Texas, to his hometown of Bonham, Texas. Some of his friends tried to talk him out of it. Sam, why do you want to go back to Texas? Right here in Washington, D.C., we have the best hospitals. We have the best doctors, the best treatment. Why do you want to go back to that little town? Rayburn's reply, because in Bonham, Texas, they know if you're sick and they care when you die. We may never be a big super church. <laughs> we may never have the best of facilities. And it could be that we'll continue on and keeping the doors open, it's going to be a struggle. But every soul needs a place where they can be loved, where you know their name, where they're recognized. We all need community. And we all need a great gospel message. And friends, right now, we are a success. Amen.
probably noticed that. I did. Yes. <laughs> but it's still a good hand. Yeah. <laughs> you have a prayer list in your bulletin, and uh, some of the names are there every week. And I hope you don't just gloss over them, but uh, take time during the week to pray for these special needs. At the bottom of our list, you see Irene's name is still there. And um, we want to continue to pray for Irene. Uh, she's still struggling with appendicitis, and she's had a CAT scan. The doctors are hopefully taking care of her. Um, so remember her in your prayers. Also, and um, I guess, in a way, maybe it's good that he's not here. Steve Bono. Steve has been worshiping with us. He works for Ford, and he comes here on his lunch break. He's not here today. But I received an email from him this week. And he asked us to pray for his daughter, Stacy. And he's really, it's an urgent prayer. Um, it's a young lady who's probably making some bad decisions. So pray for Stacy. Do you have any requests that you'd like to add to our list? Continue prayers for my Aunt Wilma and my Uncle Dick. Okay. Aunt Wilma, Uncle Dick. In the choir. Yes. As for prayers last week um, for our um, employee's wife, Heather, who had emergency surgery last Sunday and had another surgery again Wednesday and okay. um, still not on the woods yet. Okay, let's remember Heather in our prayers as she recovers from surgery. Other requests? Yes, John. Uh, for my Aunt Ellen, she's been diagnosed with cancer. And this coming week, we're going to find out whether there's going to be a therapy to help us. Okay. <clears throat> Let them back. Let's pray. Our good and gracious God, we come to the throne of grace with the names of people we love and are concerned about. Some we don't know, but... Others are praying for them, and we want to join with them in prayer. I lift up Stacy to you, a young lady who just desperately needs God in her life. I don't know what she's doing right now, Lord, but your spirit can speak to her. Just touch her heart and help her mom and dad to continue to pray and have faith that things can change. Keep her safe. We lift up our own Irene to you and ask that you will keep her in your loving arms. Please, Lord, give the doctors wisdom to take care of her. We miss her and love to have her back. We pray for healing in the name of Jesus. And we join Teresa in prayer for her, uh, Aunt Wilma and Uncle Dick. Lord, you know the needs here. Some things are impossible for us, but they're not for you. Touch them, Lord. And we join with Diana in, in prayer for Heather that she would continue on the road to recovery from surgery and, and know some better days. We pray for healing. A healing, Lord, that uh, will give her the strength and the wellness she needs, but that it will also glorify you. And with John, we pray for Aunt Helen. We hear that terrible, terrible word, cancer, so many of our loved ones we've heard over and over again, Lord, how they battle for life. Just be with her. Give her comfort and, and help the doctors as they treat her. Give her a good day today. May she sense your nearness, the nearness of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
we will now receive the morning offering.
for the church. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you and fill you with his spirit and use you this week for his honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.